Hello, I'm Phil Svitek, 360 Creative Coach, and welcome to my vlog, where it is both my mission and my pleasure to highlight my creative journey in hopes of inspiring you, giving you specific takeaway, and overall, just to make your journey at least a little bit easier, right? That's the hope. Now, before I fully dive into all the things that I wanna discuss and go over, as allow me to invite you to subscribe if you haven't already. That way you get all the various lessons and episodes that I put out right when I put them out. Thank you if you just did, and thank you if you already were. It truly does mean a lot to me. I hope it does to you. So, let's get into this. In the past, uh, let's say two weeks, right, the overall goal was to start to transition into new projects, right? And what I mean by this is, I'd completed my second feature film called A Bogota Trip. And essentially, you know, I knew there would be next steps needed with it, but overall they would require less of me. Uh, more specifically, you know, I got creatively the movie over the finish line. You know, we updated the visual effects, we updated the sound effects um, and sound in general of what I, you know, fully intended it to be um, because we did have a premiere, but like we, we essentially prioritized to make sure the movie was as good as it could be for the premiere. But then, you know, we took the opportunity to finesse a couple of things, not like re-editing and adding new scenes or taking stuff away, but, you know, just fine tuning little bits here and there. And so creatively, it's the movie that I wanted to make and it's complete, right? And of course, you know, there's still involvement, uh, you know, as far as film festivals go, you know, and keeping that ball rolling, then the marketing side of it, and, uh, you know, certainly for distribution and stuff like that, but it requires a lot less creative headspace, um, it's just more, you know, task-oriented and, you know, time-wise, a lot less as well. And so that was the hope, right? Uh, however, and and especially because, you know, at that at that point, I had essentially, you know, redid the DCP. Uh, DCP stands for Digital Digital Cinema Package, and that's literally a hard drive that you send to theaters for them to be able to play the film. Uh, and so, again, based on the revisions that we made, we updated this. And part of it was it was necessary. Um, we had made one before, and that cost you know, let's say $500, give or take. And, you know, that was a 2K version for the premiere. This upcoming festival that we're playing on September 2nd at the uh, Regal LA Live Cinema, um, the link is down below if you're interested. Uh, would love for you to join us, but I digress. Uh, the point is that, you know, their deliverables, they, they needed a 4K projection and a Blu-ray backup. So we had to do it anyway. And it was nice that we could, you know, give them the completed film now and just be done with it, right? However, of course, you know, that's another cost associated with that. And when you're going from, you know, 2K to 4K plus a Blu-ray um, all in and it ended up being around $1,300, right? Um, which is on par, you know, you can do it for cheaper, but then you need like a lead time of two to three weeks and you know, we just didn't have that, right? And it's not like you're ultimately going to save that that much money. But anyway, yeah, so, you know, it was exciting because then it really felt like, okay, the movie from that standpoint is done, right? Uh, however, you know, um, this business can oftentimes feel like entourage. And if you're unfamiliar with the show, or even if you are, what I mean by this is, you know, it's like the highs are high, the lows are low, and you go from one thing to the next really quickly. Um, and even when you think a deal is done and could be signed, you know, certain things change and, you know, just, just it's like anything else. It just things develop and so forth. And um, they might be a little bit more fast paced, um, you know, um, I guess it would be akin to like a Wall Street or something like that, where there's just, you know, so much madness all the time, um, perhaps not in other businesses, right? But 
Yeah, so, you know, there was a couple of things that I had to make decision-wise with the movie that the specifics of which um, I'm not going to get into and can't get into, but ultimately, you know, stuff that I didn't necessarily agree with, but in order to move forward in certain phases, you know, um, there are things that needed to happen, right? And, you know, sometimes you make the tough decision and you figure out, okay, well, you know, do I, do I stand and, ha um, like, essentially maintain artistic integrity or whatever or, you know, and just, and sometimes, you know, it could come off as stubbornness or whatever um, or not. And that's what, like, it very much felt in some ways like a Billy Walsh um, and Vinny Chase type of moment uh, from Entourage where, you know, it was their movie and it's like, okay, they have to like stand up uh, to the studios and kind of fight back for what they intend. And, you know, again, that has consequences one way or the other. Um, you don't obviously want to burn bridges. Again, that can mean X, Y, and Z. And really, why I chose to essentially make certain decisions that I did, which ultimately, luckily, weren't as like drastic as I'm making them out to be. Um, but um, either way, the idea was, you know, if it was just me, I would have made a different decision. However, you know, I have this team behind me that worked really hard and essentially we all chose to like look at this movie as a business endeavor and you know the decisions made not that like legally I'm obligated to like be a fiduciary in that way but I, I looked at it like I owe the best decision for the, for the team and you know if market wise and so forth this is what needs to happen then then I owe it to the team to do that um and that's kind of how I approached the decision. And that's what makes me ultimately feel good about the decision is because, you know, I did it for them um, sort of thing. Uh, and again, it's not, they're not drastic changes. Like sometimes, you know, people ask you to re-edit a you know, movie and, you know, they, they butcher it or, um, you know, the marketing can go, you know, completely awry. Um, sometimes I see this with movies like, when a movie is just completely mismarketed with the trailers and so forth, and it leads you to believe that it's one thing and then it's not, and um, it causes a rub within the audiences and stuff like that. This isn't, you know, um, a case of that. Um, but it did sort of open my eyes to, I mean, I mean just the difficulties of just being an indie artist in general um, and how you know, more and more we're getting to the commodification of all art. I mean, it was always sort of the trend, but um, I don't know, just this idea that we strictly look at art as commerce, right? As opposed to with artistic integrity. Uh, when in, you know, my theory is that that's just the snake biting its own tail. Like eventually it becomes, um, you know, a negative thing. And certainly I look at, you know, if anyone could predict the market, <laughs> then there'd be, all we'd ever have is hit movies. But certainly I, I can just can look to the summer box office. No one predicted Top Gun to do as well as it did. Uh, Lightyear not doing <laughs> well. And then everything everywhere all at once, technically not a summer movie, but you know, the, the fact that it just did bonkers in spite of like having such a weird premise and like if you've seen that movie there's a lot of stuff that like on paper are quite questionable <laughs> and you're like this is gonna be in the movie and people are gonna like that and like doesn't that seem weird like and so they made these certain bold choices right and yeah I, I always sort of look to those examples um, uh, of, of the Mavericks making certain decisions, and I'd like to kind of consider that, but um, I was having a conversation with a mentor of mine 
was also talking about like, well, the people you look up to, you know, they, they wrote their myths essentially because you don't necessarily know what they compromised on. He was like saying, you know, at the end of the day, in your movie is, has plenty of bold stuff in it. So taking out a couple of things here and there won't really make or break it because it still has enough there and it defies, you know, genre convention to begin with and plays with it and, you know, stuff like that. So I was like, okay, that makes sense, right? Um, but even before this, like, it, it really made me sort of think about the long term and, and more, more recently, the, uh, I got turned on to the idea of like using Shopify as a means of like a store, right? Um, and having created books and movies and wanting to do other stuff, you know, it's it's one of those things like how how great would it be to control that fully, right? You know, from start to finish. And what's great about Shopify is, yes, there's like a financial transaction. Um, and even though crypto is a form of uh, finances, right? I, I'm, I'm going to look at it as separate in the sense that, you know, Shopify is planning for that future, right? And not only just crypto, but NFTs and things like that. And that might not sound exciting to you. You might be kind of over that sort of talk or whatever, but I'm excited by NFTs as a form of utility. And so I, that's why like the idea of a Shopify store excites me. And, and, and part of the thing is like, I looked at Shopify for like merchandise. Uh, and then of course, like a book and a movie are merchandise, but I never considered it as an outlet for that. But on, a, on an episode of The Creative Pen with Joanna Penn, that's pen with two ends, you know, she really opened up my mind to the possibilities of this. Um, and, you know, now more than ever, I kind of love leaning into that and really controlling it because, you know, just kind of seeing things in general, you know, whether it be HBO and Discovery or more, you know, it's Warner Brothers and Discovery, kind of the handling of that and just the way things that are going in this business, the more you can kind of control your destiny, the better. And, you know, and th th that's always kind of been my big philosophy is that I'm willing to quote unquote work with the gatekeepers um, if it makes sense. But a lot of times if gatekeepers say no, then I'm not going to let that determine my fate. And uh, you know, if studio after studio says, no, we don't want to finance your movie, then I'll still make movies that I want to make, right? I'll find a way. And I have right twice and intending to do it a third time, you know, uh, same thing with like books, you know, I, I like writing books and will continue to do that. I published a fiction and nonfiction and, you know, now I'm working on my second fiction and my second nonfiction, right? Because it's fun for me. And if publishers want to publish them and work with me and it makes sense, great. But if not, I'm not going to be at that mercy. And I think a lot of times now uh, where I'm sort of becoming desensitized to it is Again, that homogenization aspect of, you know, they just try to, what's easiest to market. Secondly, you know, the idea of hedging their bets. So, you know, the guaranteed money up front tends to not be there. So essentially for them, it's a quantity game. And most times artists don't make that much money um, on these residuals. But the companies end up being fine because, you know, even if they're making like 10 bucks per product a month, you know, if they've got literally like 5,000 of these, they'll be just fine. You know, again, because there's no downside to them. Uh, it's not like they put up any upfront cost, right? And that tends to be the case, sadly. And I was listening to, there's a, there's a YouTube channel called Film Courage. And I was listening to this filmmaker talk about distribution and, you know, one of the things that he was talking about was this idea of like, if you want to sell to Netflix it almost like, you know, he didn't say like, this would be the exact strategy we need to take, but he said, this could be a strategy of putting up a, a movie up on YouTube for free, letting, you know, 2 million, hopefully people see it, you know, build that, right. Get that sort of attention and then let Netflix buy it. 
And that might seem like weird advice, but here was the thing. He was like, well, it's no different than a movie being out in theaters, right? And sort of getting attention that way. Because ultimately what Netflix wants is uh, eyeballs and hope, you know, they want your audience. So the reason that they would be buying that is because you've proven that people want to see this movie and hopefully, you know, out of that 2 million that people that have already seen that movie, you know, some of them don't have a Netflix subscription and they would, you know, essentially buy a Netflix subscription. And when you consider it that way, yeah, it, it makes sense, right? For Netflix. But for me, I look at it of like, if, if, if I literally have a movie that 2 million people liked and watched, I don't need Netflix. Like, it's just counterintuitive to the whole thing for me, right? Um, if I could have the audience without, then, without Netflix, then <laughs> why do I need Netflix, right? And it's this weird thing that if, if you want as an indie artist, just as an artist in general, you kind of have to, you know, take command of everything, be, be responsible for the marketing and so forth. And I think in, within filmmaking itself, or just any sort of creative endeavor, but you know, I'll use filmmaking as an example. People always say like, uh, budget-wise, people don't account for post-production and the cost associated with that, right? You know, the cost of editing, the cost of color correction, the cost of sound design, and then not to mention, you know, film festivals as part of that, right? But then, in a weird way, for indie filmmakers, I don't think they account for marketing, right? Because if you actually want your movie to succeed, you know, hiring a publicist, um, you, you know, putting out ads and things like that, like that, that all costs. And if you actually want your movie to be successful, that's what you kind of need to do. The, the irony of irony is even like with whatever sort of, you know, distribution and stuff like that, unless it's like the rare case, you know, you're kind of having to do it on your own, um, which is the weird part to me. And yeah, it's, it's becoming more and more evident in all forms of this business, whether it be music, whether it be books, and so forth. And it's kind of shitty to think about in that way, because it's like, you know, I've done the thing, like, it's hard enough to make the thing. But now you essentially want me to do something completely that, you know, might be outside of my skill set, right? Like, we're not marketers, we're not social media gurus, and so forth. Um, so it's like, whoa. And listen, you know, again, you can hire people to, to do that stuff who are savvy and can bring that to the table, but that comes at a cost. And these are all things to, you know, sort of really consider. And, and you know, I'm, I'm someone that tries not to argue with reality. And so it might sound like I'm being bitter about it, but no, it, to me, it's just learning the landscape. And then again, What's my place in this and how do I like, you know, make the most of it? If this is, these are the cards that I'm dealt with, then let's go, you know? And, and again, there's like a Jordan Peele with Universal. He has a wonderful relationship with Universal. They've been, you know, they always market his movies great. They put a lot of support behind it. You know, fantastic, right? But that's the creme de la creme. Those are like, you know, that, that you know, that pinnacle of it all. And I imagine like you listening to this are sort of more in that phase where I am, you know, where, you know, you still maintain a full-time job. What you do is tends to be on the side, um, you know, and so forth. Right. And you're having to self fund projects and whatever else. Right. So, you know, this is, this is the reality in which we work in. Right. And if the so-called gatekeepers, you know, see a project that we make and want to put behind it money and the full force of what they're able to bring, great, right? That is the hope. And as I said, I'm willing to work with that. But if, if, if it's a no, then, uh, then yeah, I, I am prepared to sort of work within the, the reality that is. Um, so, yeah, all in all, I've essentially... You know, it, as much as I want to creatively move on to the next project, a lot of mental energy and, and thinking went into kind of considering the, the right choices for this current movie. And as I said, for me personally, I might have made different decisions. Um, but because, you know, I have a team that, uh, 
that not, not that I answer to, but I want to make sure I have what's in their best interest at heart, then I made decisions to, um, you know, to, to hedge the bets in the correct way and move on in phases that would benefit everyone, um, whether from a financial standpoint, whether from, uh, you know, an exposure standpoint, right? Getting them as much notoriety as possible and so forth, right? So, um, yeah, that's kind of um, what what I've been sort of overall dealing with. And um, if you're curious, like, as to kind of, you know, uh, I, I've been, like, researching just things in general, but I'll link to the Joanna Penn episode about Shopify because uh, I think it's a great just episode in general of what's possible, but then more specifically, she really breaks down like how to do this, <laughs> like literally how to open up a store, you know, taxes, like all this stuff, right? Literally from, you know, from point A to point Z, right? And all the steps in between. And then I'll also link to um, the Film Courage episode that I'm talking about. So those will both be in the description box for you to listen to, right? Um, and there's other resources that I've been like looking to, but those would be sort of the primary examples of, you know, what I've been uh, thinking about. Um, you know, the other interesting aspect of this, because I was so like in memory lane about like the movie and just thinking about things in general, um, there was a side to me of like, that, that just thought about like blink and it'll be over, right? And I said this to the team, like um, when we went to Columbia to film the second movie of like, yeah, just do what you can to enjoy it because we'll be there and then we'll be gone, right? And it's so funny. I, I remember just making breakfast in the mornings, most mornings for the, for the crew. And like, you know, we had like essentially a family breakfast, right? You know, everyone got their day started in whatever fashion, like, you know, there'd be Sarah doing yoga in the living room. You know, Khalil uh, would be watching like shows on, on his phone. Um, you know, people would be in bathrooms getting ready, hair and makeup. And, you know, people, again, some people got up really early. Some people got up, you know, close to the start of the day um, in terms of filming and so forth. But, um, but yeah, I, you know, so for me, like part of the routine was uh, just making breakfast for everybody um and you know having it be ready and it was it was fun you know like again it's just stuff like that that uh in the moment like i knew it, it was a good shared experience and i i knew like they they really enjoyed the breakfast and so forth um but yeah it came and went and it's just a fun memory that i, I look back upon right um you know it's interesting that's all. Anyway, uh, you know, as far as new projects, so the fun aspect and why I was like so gun ho and now I'm able to sort of, you know, get back into that spirit again was I am working on my second novel, uh, my, my second nonfiction book, and then a third film, right? And specifically with the third film, I had essentially written two outlines for two completely different projects and I was willing to do either I really was um but I let um I let someone close to me make the decision because I wanted them involved and I said hey you know uh for you to be a part of this I want you to have some ownership so what project would you want to take on and um you know, what's interesting about it is that in some sense, so this is um, Sarah Stratton, the, the actor, who's now been both my movies. And so I want to reward her because she's always done great, but always kind of been a secondary character. Um, and so I want to really reward her and put her in a lead role. And I thought for sure um, she would pick this movie that, that was a family drama, let's say, for lack of a better um, term, and, you know, keeping it vague. 
and the reason I thought that was because of obvious reasons, like, you know, we're going to film on location in a different country. Uh, it's, it, it's uh, you know, it felt like a, a script that she would, you know, get behind. And also, it's live action, right? And uh, I thought the, the selfish side, you know, which, fine, whatever, I'm not going to knock it, you know, uh, would want something for her real, would want to be on camera, like, literally. Um, and yeah, I thought that's why she would pick that one. But she actually surprised me and picked um, this animated feature that I want to do that's more like fantasy, sci-fi, and, you know, would still obviously involve her. Like, the idea is to have actors where we'd film everything, um, but you wouldn't need like backgrounds. It's more like sort of how Amazon's Undoes It, Undone does it, where they film in like this warehouse and literally like they don't have a set. It's just like this random open space and they might have a prop here and there. If, you know, they're drinking from a glass, they'll have a glass. But beyond that, like nothing else as far as what would be in the scene is there, right? And so they have to essentially play make believe. And, you know, they film that. And then that's more of a rotoscoping technique where, you know, they essentially animate everything in terms of that. Mine would be more of a, of a reference. So, for example, the easiest way to kind of think of this is I can cast all of my friends, you know, who are, you know, relatively young. But there's like, let's say, a character that's supposed to be 90 years old in the project. Well, you know... In lieu, of the per in lieu of getting a 90-year-old actor, um, I can continue to work with my friends and then we just animate them as a 90-year-old person, right? Um, so essentially everything would be filmed as reference. Um, and it's a project that I love, but, but yeah, it did kind of, you know, surprise me that she picked it. But, you know, I often talk about the be beauty of, you know, any project is just the simplicity of choice, you know, just the choice to make it. And... You know, this is like, it was, it wasn't like a, hey, you know, I think I'd like to make this one. This was like an outright, I want to do this one, right? And I was like, okay, you know, you've chosen. And so I'm going to, you know, I said you would get to pick and let's do it, right? And so I'm, I'm now excited to, to do it. And I had a great meeting with um, Emily Kremholtz and John Comerford, who are fantastic writers, and, you know, story editors and so forth. And I got a lot of great feedback from them um, about both outlines. Um, at the time when I met with them, I didn't know which, which one Sarah was going to pick. But, um, but it's beneficial, right? Because I still intend to make the other project, the family drama. Just I have to do one before the other, right? And that's fun. So none of it gets wasted. Uh, but it was it was a very good creative meeting, and so I'm excited to, you know, get into that. And that's kind of what I want to focus on, um, you know, moving forward, um, and you know, slowly transitioning to that. Like I said, I mean, I still have to take care of just, you know, finalizing things with this movie, um, the second movie that I made, and get it over. You know, I got over the creative finish line, as I mentioned, but now just um, in terms of putting it out into the world, right? And so, you know, but the big, big stuff really, you know, happened in the past, like, two weeks. And so now I can really, you know, I can, I can transition, right? So I can start with you know, my goal is like three days a week to, to, to really work on these projects. And then, you know, maybe in September by like the, the mid September, I can really increase and ramp that up to even more. Right. And as I said, so, um, I'm going to be splitting my time with this third movie, this, uh, second novel and a second nonfiction. Right now, as far as things are concerned, you know, as far as the, the movie, my first goal is to write out a more specific treatment of this movie. So I have it outlined. And 
it's pretty detailed in some parts and then pretty loose in the others. Now, you know, my goal is to essentially within a screenwriting software, uh, basically create the script, but not like literally write every line of dialogue or like, you know, actual, you know, action lines and so forth. Just more about like, you know, from scene to scene, here's kind of what happens. And if I have a line of dialogue, I might place it in. If I have a moment of specificity, I might add it in, but the idea is just to flesh it out further, you know? And so it could be like, uh, you know, um, these, these two armies fight. I don't know, I'm just making that up, right? These two armies fight um, on, on a mountain, right? And like literally that could be like a, uh, the thing, or as I said, it can be more specific than that. Um, and it'll fluctuate, you know, on that spectrum, but it'll, it'll paint a clearer picture of what the story is. Then we can, you know, really start to look at it as a group and, and, and uh, you know, make adjustments accordingly. So that's what the film. With the novel, uh, it's just kind of continuing. You know, for me, the the holdup has seen seemed to be chapter three, and luckily, you know, I, I finally creatively figured out some solutions. I talked about it in the last episode of the vlog about that, um, and now I've just been writing it. It's a pretty hefty chapter. I've been working on it, and as I said, I slowed down because of everything else, but now I'm, I'm getting back into it, and then I think the the rest of it will and should be a lot easier you know this you know the first three chapters really had to set up and world build in a way that wasn't like overly expositional and you know i think i found that balance uh, at least well enough with the first draft that i can continue on with the rest of the book then as far as the nonfiction book i'm in the midst of looking for uh, a ghostwriter and, you know, for me, I always take a hybrid approach to things. So what I mean by that is I've literally done, I've dictated um, each chapter, right? I outlined the, the book. I've dictated each chapter, uh, you know, verbally and then had it transcribed. And so now it's about someone taking that and revising it. Um, to be a book, right? And so that's why it's, you know, I feel confident um, that it still maintains my voice. It's still my overall vision. It's not just like, you know, hey, I have this idea f for a book, go write it. And, you know, it just becomes sort of that. And I've never worked with a ghostwriter and I don't necessarily, you know, so any sort of notion that I have is an assumption to a degree, right? I mean, I'm informed enough where I can kind of guess at like what it all looks like and is. Um, but I tend to, you know, try to be involved in anything that's certainly my projects, right? And so uh, I try to make it as easy and simplistic as possible for those people so that they, you know, don't have to create from scratch, but it's really in a direction that I'm, you know, trying to gravitate towards, right? So um, that's, how, that's how I'm approaching that one. The sort of last fun thing, um, you know, pa Patreon's doing this like club community or something like that. Um, essentially, you know, there would be like these groups formed and you know, there'd be a leader that, you know, selects topics and they would meet week to week for, you know, I think about eight weeks. And I applied to, to essentially be a captain of that. Um, not that my Patreon is that strong. It is there if you would like to support it and it does have, I feel like, great rewards. But, you know, um, I applied because it seemed interesting and, you know, I like doing new things and also just kind of building a community and, and meeting new people to build a community with. And so, you know, we'll see what comes of it. There's a meeting today um, that I'm going to be a part of that's like an introductory meeting into what this is and how it all work. So I'll have more details for you in the future. But it's great that, you know, the, the heads of Patreon are kind of, you know, recognize that and know that, like, that they've built this platform and, you know, how can they essentially foster the talent that is there? I think um, that's pretty cool. So, yeah, that's kind of what I've been up to and you know, dealing with, but uh, I know I've been 
I've, I've tried to be as specific as I can with what I could be, but I know I was vague with a lot of this stuff and hopefully it was simple to track. You know, you're welcome to ask questions um, and I'll answer any that I can. Um, some of them I might say like, I can't divulge that information, at least not at this moment, but, um, but yeah, hopefully you got something out of this as always. Um, you know, comment down below, questions, thoughts, anything in between, right? Um, as I made mention, you know, I have books and movies out there. So if you would like to support that, it'd mean a lot to me because, you know, if that stuff can be self-sustaining, then I can continue to make more of it. Thus, you know, learn and share freely here with you. That is the symbiotic relationship of all that. And likewise, if, uh, you know, you think you might benefit from co coaching, that is available to you. Um, it's linked to down in the description box. Or if you want to just kind of dip your toe in and see how I can help you, well, that's what my Patreon page is for. You know, patreon.com slash philsvitek. So check that out. And, uh, yeah, you know, there's fun, various tiers of support that get you, you know, various rewards. So check it out. Anyway, I've yapped your ear off enough for today. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. I hope to see you next time.